Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about kidney sales. Um, this lecture and the one that follows it um, are doing double duty. I had the foresight to assign the same topic for both of my classes for the same week, thinking that it would reduce my workload when I have a new baby. So um, I'm recording one lecture for both of my classes. That's why this is both my 105, Intro to Social and Moral Issues, and also my 249, Biomedical Ethics. Both of you all are using the same lecture uh, videos for this week. Okay, the first um, article that I assigned that I wanted you to read was by a slew of authors. I think if I count correctly, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight authors here. When that happens, when there, when there are that many people, um, they usually use this Latin phrase, uh, hold on, Janet Radcliffe Richards, that's the first author, et al. So et al here means and a bunch of other people. Janet Radcliffe Richards is a philosopher and she is the lead author. And then there were like seven other co-authors, okay? And then this is the article that I asked you to read, The Case for Allowing Kidney Sales. And this was a relatively short piece, I think uh, two pages on the PDF. And then the third page, there are some footnotes. Um, but there's still quite a bit to talk about and quite a lot in the context that I want to tell you about to kind of uh, educate you on what the problem is that motivates some people to think that we should be um, allowing people to sell kidneys. Okay, so the outline is I want to tell you some of that context and then I want to go over uh, Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors battery of arguments. Okay, those are the two main points and in the context there are some sub points. I want to talk about the shortage of kidneys I want to talk about dialysis, um, I want to talk about some workarounds, and I want to talk about the morbidity, uh, mortality. The morbidity is basically the technical word for like suffering. Uh, if bad things happen to you but you don't die, that's called morbidity. If you die, that's called mortality uh, of donating a kidney. How bad is it? How much do you reduce your life and how much do you suffer if you get rid of one kidney? So I want to talk about that. The battery of arguments, there's actually a ton of arguments that Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors talk about. And this is their main argumentative strategy, is to consider a bunch of arguments um, against allowing kidney sales and then try to refute all of them. So they talk about disgust. Disgust. They talk about, maybe I should, instead of having like eight different bullet points that'll make the slide really tiny, I'm gonna just put it all on one line right here, okay? So disgust is one, um, harm, and paternalism is another, uh, autonomy, exploitation, uh, let's see what else I gotta scroll down, altruism, and consequences. Okay, so they will talk about objections from each of these categories and they will try to refute those objections. Okay, let's talk a little bit about context and let's talk about the shortage, the organ shortage. Well, maybe the first thing I want to show you is this slide that I've pre-prepared. I usually don't like to pre-prepare slides, but for something like this, a picture, I guess, is worth a thousand words. Um, this slide shows you, this image shows you how many people are on the waiting list for organs. Okay, this is not kidneys. This is all organs, okay? And then how many people, uh, I'm sorry, how many transplants happen, and then how many donors there are. Okay. The reason there are more transplants here in blue than there are donors here in yellow is because, of course, every donor, not every donor, but many donors can donate more than one organ. So you have, you know, more than twice as many transplants as there are donors. Okay. But the people on the waiting list for organs just keeps growing and the gap between the waiting list and how many organs we can transplant also keeps growing. Although recently there's some maybe cause for optimism. I'm not sure what's going on here in the last couple of years. There's been this dip. I would love to see whether this continues, but this is the most recent data I could find from 2017. I would love to see this kind of go down and the blue and the yellow lines go up. But you know, for now, like it maybe looks promising, but there's still a tremendous gap, okay? And that's true not just for kidneys, but for all other organs. Uh, it turns out though that kidneys are by far the most commonly transplanted organ in the world today. Unless you count something like blood. You know, if you count blood as an organ, then yeah, that gets transplanted a lot. Okay, let me give you some statistics then. Um, let's see. So I'll go back to this slide. I'll go back one to the shortage. 
In January 2019, I, I saw an article from January 2019 that had the following numbers. About 126,000 people diagnosed with ESRD. This is end-stage renal disease. And what the word end-stage, renal is the fancy word for kidney. So this is basically end-stage kidney disease. Not basically, just is, literally, end-stage kidney disease. What end-stage means is that the disease is so bad that your kidney is not going to cure itself. Your kidney is eventually going to die. So anything before end-stage, there's hope for recovery. But once you enter end-stage, what that means is there's no more hope for recovery of that organ. The organ is gone and never coming back. Okay, so there are 126,000 people diagnosed with uh, ESRD every year. This is all uh, um, annual stats in the USA. Okay, 126,000 diagnosed every year. Uh, about half of those uh, would do well with a transplant. Some are maybe too old or too sickly, have other issues going on, or don't need a transplant, they're about to die anyway. Okay, but just about half of those would do well with a transplant, so that's about 63,000, okay? Of those, about 31,000 get added to the list, to the waiting list, okay? So there's already a drop-off between those who would do well with a transplant and those who are officially added to the list because sometimes people just don't bother adding themselves to the list because the list is so long, okay? Um, and then about 31,000 get added to the waiting list and about 20,000 uh, transplants every year. This is kidney transplants, okay? Annual stats in USA, uh, kidneys only. Okay, this is all kidneys, okay? So you might say, hey, that's not that bad. The gap is only about 11,000, okay, between how many get added to the waiting list and how many transplants there are. But first of all, the gap is about 43,000 if you consider how many people would do well with a transplant. Second of all, this gap continues to grow because every year you add another 43,000 people, uh, another 43,000 who kind of uh, cannot get transplants but would do well with them. And so every year you would expect the gap to increase by 43,000, okay? There's one fact that would bring that gap down and does in fact bring that gap down every year. So the gap is not actually going growing by 43,000 every year. The gap grows by less than that and that's because people die on the waiting list. So you would expect a gap of 43,000 every year, but because many people die, the cap grows, but it doesn't grow quite that fast. Okay. Um, of the uh, 20,000 transplants, um, 6,000 are from living donors. And living kidneys tend to do better. Transplants from living kidneys tend to do better than transplants, what they call cadaveric transplants, from people who have just died. Okay, so these living donor kidney transplants, they tend to add, typically add, add about 12 to 20 years of life. They're not perfect. They don't give you a fully new, you know, lease on life, but they do add substantially to your life. If you've ever been deathly ill or if anyone you know has ever been deathly ill, you don't scoff at another 12 to 20 years. You know, you don't say, oh man, I wish you could live forever. No, like 12 to 20 years is a tremendous, has a tremendous value, even if it's not like a perfect uh, cure that you just go back to being completely healthy again. Okay, so 6,000 from living donors, they typically add about 12 to 20 years of life. The rest are cadaveric, okay? Again, from people who have just died, okay? And those add, those add about eight to 12 years of life, okay? So still better than nothing, but not as good as living donors, okay? And the proposal that we are considering today is whether we should pay people to give up one kidney, because you have two, okay? And those would all be living donors. So those would all be in this better category that um, in the proposal we're considering. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, another point about how rare donors, donors, donors are, okay? Only about half of us in this country are registered as donors. This is something you can do whenever you renew your driver's license. You just check that box that says that you want to be a donor. Only about half of us in this country actually check that box, okay? But, and you might think, well, half of us, that's quite a lot, right? 
half of it's quite a lot. But remember, these are going to be cadaveric donors. When you sign up on your driver, uh, driver's license to be a donor, you're not saying, come take a, one of my kidneys right now. What you're saying is, if I ever die in just the right way, then you can take my kidneys. Okay, so only about half of us are registered as donors, but uh, to donate cadaverically, okay, uh, you have to die in a way that keeps oxygenated blood flowing uh, through the organs, okay? But only, um, I had two buts in that sentence, so only about one to two percent of people die this way, okay? So you have to die in such a way that like, uh, oh, this is cataphorically, okay, I'll, maybe that's a made up word, that's what Apple is telling me, but whatever, you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, only about 1-2% to of people die in just the right way where they can keep blood flowing through their organs, uh, maybe other than their brain, at the time of death. So even though we have a bunch of organ donors, half of us in this country, we still, uh, um, even though half of us agree to be organ donors, very, very, very few of us die in such a way that we can actually donate our organs on our death. Okay. So that's the shortage. Um, and then there's this slide. Okay, so next I want to talk about dialysis. So dialysis, dialysis is a process that functionally replaces uh, the uh, one of one of the main functions of the kidney kidneys, which is to clean toxins out of your blood. Okay, so what it does is. It takes blood from your body, okay, and puts it through a machine outside your body. Like the machines have gotten smaller over the years. It used to be something you had to wheel across on like one of these big trays, and now it could be like as small as a suitcase or something, okay. And so you take your blood through a tube and you know divert it into this one of these machines. And it, the machine has a bunch of membranes, and the membranes filter out all the toxins from your blood and then put your blood right back into your body, okay. So dialysis takes blood from you and runs it through some external filters, okay? And then uh, places the clean blood back into your body. Okay, and there are a couple of ways that this can be done and the technical details don't really concern us, but the, the main point is uh, dialysis is a substitute, substitute for your kidneys. It's not a perfect sub substitute, and that's kind of what I, what I want to talk about in this slide of context, um, but it's imperfect, okay? Um, in principle, you can live on dialysis forever. So you can have no kidneys or end-stage kidney disease, and you can have dialysis, and in principle, you will not die from kidney disease. You will die from something else, okay? Um, in principle, you can live on dialysis forever, where forever means you'll die of something else before you die of kidney disease, okay? Uh, but in practice, it adds about five years to life. So sorry, often when I teach this class in person, I ask for a show of hands if anyone in the class knows someone who's on dialysis. And typically I get at least two or three students who know someone, you know, a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, whatever, who's on dialysis. And then I have to break this bad news to them that typically someone who's on dialysis, they only, when they start dialysis, unless they get a, a new kidney, they have typically about five more years to live. Okay, because there, people who are on dialysis tend to be very sick. Dialysis is not always that great. And it's kind of a miserable experience. Okay, which is what I want to talk about next. So dialysis is miserable and in poor countries, anyway, sometimes unavailable. Okay. Um, it's miserable in that, maybe I, let me have a sub bullet here. It's miserable in that um, it causes nausea, vomiting, cramps, dizziness, chronic fatigue, Okay, you often have to have a restricted diet, um, and it's usually something that you have to you have to do uh, maybe three times per week, about four hours per session. Okay, so this can be very 
inconvenient, to say the least. So if you have to be dialyzed three times a week, or you die, you know, for four hours per session, think about taking vacations. You just don't do it. Think about traveling to see, you know, your family or something. You don't do it because you need to be by your dialysis clinic every other day. And then when you go there, like think about taking off this much time from work, three times a week, four hours per session. It's just terrible. Okay. So as I said, in principle, we can dialyze people who have end-stage kidney disease. In practice, it turns out to be not that great. People, it adds about five years to life, which is good, better than nothing, like I you know, said in the previous slides, better than nothing. It's very good to have that extra five years of life, but a transplant would be better. Okay, transplant, it also turns out, let me, let me uh, need more room on these slides. How come the margins have to be so big? Um, Transplant turns out to be cheaper than long-term dialysis, too, okay? Because for dialysis, these people have to keep going back, keep going back multiple times a week, four hours at a time for the rest of their lives, okay? Transplant is a one-and-done deal. You have to take medications for the rest of your life so you don't reject the organ. But other than that, it's a one-and-done deal, and, you know, it turns out in the long run to be cheaper than dialysis, okay? So what are we going to do? We have this huge shortage. We have this one thing we could do, or we do do, um, but it's not that great. Transplants would be better. What can we do to alleviate this problem? Okay, well, it turns out there are some workarounds that people ha are already doing or that we have discussed and that people think, hey, these might be okay. So here's a workaround. One, uh, priority for donors. So this, the way this basically goes is, if you agree on your driver's license to be a donor, you get higher priority if you ever need an organ. Okay, so anytime you get put on the organ waiting list, they'll look, look at your driver's license and say, hey, is this guy an organ donor? If so, we'll boost him up a couple of spots or whatever. I don't know, a couple, I just made that up. But this is a proposal that many people are taking seriously. It's kind of a, you know, like for like. If you are willing to donate an organ, then you get a higher chance of getting an organ first before other people do, okay? So that's a proposal some people find reasonable. Um, here's another one, um, opt-out consent. So this is kind of like what I'm doing now for our uh, papers. Uh, when I say you have to opt in for comments, what I mean by that on your papers, what I mean by that is if you want comments, all you have to do is tell me and then I'll give you comments. Otherwise, I just assume you don't want any. So opt-out consent is just like that, except the opposite, opt-out instead of opt-in, right? So opt-out consent says we presume everyone consents to donate organs unless they specify otherwise, right? Opt out. Okay, and all you have to do is specify that you don't want to be an organ donor, and then we would just not take your organs. Otherwise, you just automatically are, as default, an organ donor. Okay, so um, how much difference can this make? It turns out quite a bit. So like when I ask you all to opt in for giving comments, on papers, very few people opt in, which is great for me, less work. Similarly here for opt-out consent for kidney donation, very few people just uh, try to change the default. So a 2012 study found donation rates above 90% for opt-in countries. Okay, um, oh, I'm sorry, opt-out countries, sorry opt-out countries, and these include countries like France does this, Austria, Spain, Belgium, okay, some of these kind of, I guess, continental European countries, I guess, whereas opt-in countries typically have maybe around 15% buy-in, where you have to, you know, click the button to say you want to be a donor. Okay, so that's another option. A third option is um, you could change the definition of death. Okay, this is something my biomedical ethics class has gone over already. My social and, um, excuse me, moral issues class did not go over this. But this is something that has already happened. We have changed the definition of death from kind of cardiac, from heart and lungs, to a brain-centered uh, definition of death. And that has freed up a bunch of organs from people whose heart and lungs continue to work 
but whose brain no longer works. So now we classify these people as dead and we can take their organs sooner than if we had to wait for their heart and lungs to stop. Okay, that's something that's happening. Um, if you think that sounds kind of horrible and unethical, I encourage you to go look at the slides from, or you know, listen to the video lecture from that week in uh, biomedical ethics. I think even the people in my social and moral um, issues class can access those videos on YouTube. So if you're interested in that, you can go to my YouTube site and look at the videos for the definition of death. Okay, that's another thing we can do. Um, another thing we can do, a fourth thing, is we can. Uh, broaden uh, what we mean, what counts as compensation for donors. So what we are going to talk about for the rest of this uh, unit is paying people to give up their organs. So like they can make a profit, but most people are okay with something like compensation. For example, uh, an example of compensation would be e.g. paying bus fare only one S on bus, bus fare uh, for donors on the way to the hospital. So if they got to ride the bus to the hospital and they have to pay for that, we should reimburse them for their bus ticket, okay? But what some people have proposed and what seems reasonable to me, although like to be honest, I don't know how much um, buy-in other people have about this. What seems reasonable to me is to compensate also for, compensate for lost time at work, okay? and for uh, nursing care after uh, the transplant. So here we're talking about the people who give up their organs. If they have to miss time at work, how much would they have gotten paid at work? Whatever their salary is that they lost, we should make that up to them. And then if they require care after the transplant, for example, home care, they should get this for free. Or if one of their loved ones or family members is taking care of them, like if their spouse is taking care of them, we should reimburse that person for those hours that the spouse puts in to care for this person who gave up a kidney, okay? This all, again, seems very reasonable to me. You're not trying to make a profit. You're only compensating for things that are lost. Uh, and yet still, this is like a proposal that you know is being considered, but I don't think it has been enacted anywhere yet. Okay, there's one other workaround that I want to talk about, and maybe I'll try to talk about it on a different slide, and that is donation chains, okay? Um, see you next slide. Um, actually, I'm going to pause and see if I can find a picture of this online, because usually when I discuss this in class, I draw a picture on the board because it's just so much easier. So I'm going to pause and see if there's a photo, an image of this that I can just paste into the, into the slideshow. Okay. Okay, I found a good picture for us on donation chains. Okay, here's a photo or a, an image about of what donation chains are. And this is something that when I first heard about it, I thought, wow, that's a genius idea. How come I had never thought of this before? Because once you understand it and have it explained to you, it just seems so simple and obvious. But for me anyway, it was not the sort of thing that I would have thought of on my own before someone explained it uh, to me. Okay, so here's what happens in a donation chain. Well, I guess before the donation chain, think first about like if there's one donor here, this guy B that I'm circling, and he's best friends with this recipient A. So maybe they're married. Maybe donor is, you know, husband and recipient is wife or something. Donor loves wife, you know, husband loves wife and wants to give up his kidney for her. Unfortunately, though, suppose he is not a good match for her. That's too bad because he doesn't want to give up his kidney to anyone else, say this other random guy in tan here, in brown here. He only wants to give up his kidney for his wife right? Well, here's what can happen. If you have a lot of people like that who are willing to be kind of paired donor pairs between, you know, husband and wife, son and, you know, father or whatever, okay? If you have a bunch of people like that, what you can try to do is to set up a chain so that if each pair is not compatible, like this one is not compatible here, this pair is not compatible, this one is not compatible here, what you can instead do is have one person donate to the one you want to give to, and then have you give to someone else, and then have the person who's paired with that one to give to someone else, and you can continue on this chain, okay? Now that I see this, I, I see that they are using compatibility. They're using, I think, blood type, type B, type A, type A, type O, and so on, right? So you can m make these chains based on blood type so that you maximize the number of people who get a kidney. If you only had to rely on targeted donations, like I want to donate only to my wife, uh, you want to donate only to your mother, 
but you are not, I'm not a good match for my wife. You're not a good match for your mother, okay? If we only run up, relied on targeted pairs, we might have zero donations. But if we allow this kind of mixing and matching to say, okay, you wanna donate for your mother, I wanna donate for my wife, but I'm a perfect match for your mother, you're a perfect match for my wife, why don't we just swap? I donate to your mother, you donate to my wife, we get two transplants instead of zero. Okay, what a donation chain does is they try to have as many links in that chain, not just two, but as many links as possible. What I've heard um, is, uh, I heard this a couple of years ago, the biggest chain that they have coordinated is like 10, like 10 pairs of donations. And think about the logistics of this, because these people have to be kind of simultaneously or pretty close to simultaneously giving up their kidney and waiting for the next one and so on. Okay, anyway, it's a pretty cool idea, donation chains. Okay. What about the risk of donating now? Okay, so you might think, hey, if I give up my kidney, does that shorten my life? Does it make my life worse off somehow? Am I no longer able to like run marathons or you know go to work if I have only one kidney? Because remember, we have two. Okay, turns out giving up a kidney has very little effect on your life. Maybe some, but not very much, okay? And here's some, some of the data that, uh, that I saw on this. So here's a 2001 study uh, with a lot of people in it, okay? And it showed the following, risk of death in the first 90 days was 3.1 per 10,000 compared to 3.1 per 10,000 donors, kidney donors. So for every 10,000 people who donated a kidney, 3.1 of them died within the first 90 days, okay? And they compared that to a control of uh, 0.4 people um, out of 10,000 control, okay? And so this is a big jump, okay? And they called this, uh, within the first 90 days, surgical mortality. Okay, so what they meant by this is if you die within the first 90 days of your surgery, we're just going to lump all those together and say you died because of some complication in the surgery. All right, and what they found, not surprisingly, was if you undergo a surgery, you have general anesthesia, you are at risk of some kind of death, death from infection, from anesthesia going wrong, not enough oxygen to the brain, anything like that. Okay, so there is an increased risk of death just from surgery alone, 3.1 per 10,000 compared to 0 0.4 per 10,000. The control was people who are matched for like age and health, but who did not have a surgery. Okay, so there is a risk of death just from surgery. But now what about risk of death uh, in one year? And they call this um, not surgical mortality, but like, uh, you know, kidney donation mortality. So this is, they call it like the mortality from only having one kidney rather than the mortality from undergoing an operation, okay? So here, the numbers were a little bit closer, okay? Not perfectly close together. Now, they're not identical, but they're a little bit closer together. Okay, 6.5 per 10,000 uh, for donors compared to, what was it? 4.6 per 10,000 uh, controls. Okay, so within one year, the people who donated, every 10,000 people who donated, you would expect six and a half of them to be dead within one year. And then if you took 10,000 other people who didn't give up a kidney but were matched for like health and age and so on, only 4.6 of those 10,000 would die. So there's still an elevated risk of death, but it's not that much, it's pretty small. Okay, so there is some risk of donating, but it's not the end of the world. You can get by with just one kidney. All right. Now I want to talk about the Radcliffe Richards articles, okay? So I want to talk about the battery of arguments that Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors discuss. Okay, the first one is disgust, okay? So some people say the thought of selling kidneys is revolting, disgusting, okay? Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors, they respond, the feeling of disgust is not enough when lives are on the line, okay? It's not enough just to say, ooh, that feels gross to me, when people are literally dying because there are not enough kidneys to go around, okay? All right, next up. Some of these we're gonna go through pretty quickly. Um, 
harm and paternalism. Okay, now paternalism is forcing people to do things for their own good. Examples include seatbelt laws, helmet laws, that, you know, in other words, laws that require you to wear a seatbelt, laws that require you to wear a helmet. Drug laws can be interpreted this way. Drugs are really dangerous. Drugs are bad, okay? Uh, and yeah, so we have laws prohibiting you from taking drugs for your own sake, you know, for your, for your benefit. Okay, so the idea behind this objection is, the objection goes, um, giving up a kidney harms you, so we should forbid you from selling your kidney. Okay, well here's what Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors have to say about that. They say, uh, first, uh, vendors, they call these vendors instead of donors because they're vending, they're selling their kidney rather than donating, which is free, okay? They say vendors want to sell, so forbidding sales harms them even more, okay? When vendors say, hey, I'm willing to give up my kidney for this much money, if you prevent that from do, if you prevent them from doing that, then you are harming them because that's something they think improves their lives, and you're forbidding them from improving their lives. Okay, and the other point they want to make is they say um, donation isn't harmful enough to ban, right? So donation, remember, is giving up your kidney for free, not getting anything in return. We allow that already. Um, so if donation, giving up your kidney for free is not so harmful that we should ban it, then why should we ban getting money in return for doing that, okay? So adding money can only make things better, not worse. Okay, so that's harm and paternalism. Next uh, set of objections, um, autonomy. And this uh, objection actually comes in two forms. So one form of lack of autonomy is incompetence. Oh, maybe I should say what autonomy is, because I think in neither class are we going to talk about it. One of the topics that we cut from the biomedical ethics class was about advanced directives in dementia, and there I would have talked a lot about autonomy. But because we cut that topic, we're not going to talk at all about autonomy. So autonomy is basically uh, the right to choose how to live your life. Okay, just making choices about like what career you know you want, who you get to marry what kind of lifestyle you want, even small things like what meals you want to eat, you know, what you want to do with your free time, what kind of music to listen to. This is all autonomy, okay? The right to choose these things, okay? So one way you can lack autonomy is being incompetent, not being, not having the cognitive capacity to understand these choices, okay? Another kind of lack of autonomy is coercion, literally being forced into one thing or another. Okay, so there are objections along both lines. So some people say uh, vendors are often incompetent. They don't understand what they're getting into. Okay, and another problem, another potential problem anyway, is um, uh, vendors are so desperate they have no real alternatives. If they are if they are considering selling their kidneys, then their lives must be so desperate that they have no genuine alternatives to that, so they're forced into it. Okay, these are the two objections that Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors want to consider. Okay, so for incompetence, um, we say, Radcliffe Richards et al., we should educate rather than ban. Okay. So there are a lot of decisions, including medical decisions, where most people are incompetent. And we don't say that, therefore, no one is allowed to make medical decisions for themselves. What we do is we just educate those people. Now, you might say, hey, sometimes education doesn't work. Sometimes people are just too dumb. They can never figure things out. Um, in that case, even if we can't, or even if education doesn't work, we can assign guardians, they say, okay? So an example, and not, I was gonna say analogy, it's not really an analogy, but it's another example of that. Um, think of how we treat children, okay, for medical care. So you, tr you can try to explain things to kids, but they're too stupid, they're not always gonna understand what's going on with their health care. but we have guardians for them. They're parents who decide on their behalf what to do in their best interest. 
So Radcliffe, Richards, and her co-authors, they say we should do the same thing for kidneys. If people just cannot understand, we can assign them guardians who make decisions on their behalf in their best interest. Okay. What about coercion? Okay, here, uh, Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors, they say, um, they say, uh, forbidding kidney sales makes the range of choices even narrower, okay? So this complaint about coercion basically says, these people who are so desperate to sell their kidneys, they don't have a lot of options about what to do, okay? If they are even considering selling a kidney, that means their range of options is very limited. Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors, they reply, true, that's very true, but if you take away one of those options, then you are making their range of choices even more limited. So they may resort to things that are even more desperate than selling a kidney. Okay, so that's autonomy. Next, exploitation. This is something we've talked about before. Um, I I think we talked about it before in my biomedical ethics class, and we did not talk about this before for my um, social and moral philosophy class. Okay, but exploitation, uh, here the worry is uh, vendors are vulnerable to being underpaid and cheated, okay? Um, okay, Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors, they say the right response is regulation not banning, okay? Because if you think about this idea of exploitation, exploitation is possible in lots of different areas. It's possible for like people who, who make your iPhone, people who make your Nike sneakers, people who you know pick your coffee beans. Exploitation is possible in all these areas, but it doesn't mean that we ban iPhones, ban shoes, ban coffee. What it means is we need to regulate these industries so that people are treated properly. Okay, um, let's see, what else did I wanna say? Oh, there are further objections you could make in this vein. You could say like, you know, but no regulatory system is perfect. And then their response to that is, okay, exploitation is worse when uh, kidney sales are illegal. So if they're legal, at least we can make them or regulate them so that they will be safe. Whereas if they are illegal, then we cannot regulate them at all, and then things will be even worse. Okay? And then the last uh, version of this exploitation objection is that it's unfair that the rich have privileges, privileges, you know, aka the organs, literally, that the poor cannot get. Okay? So it's unfair that we can that you can pay for organs and only rich people will get organs, okay? So their response, first of all, they say, this applies to many other things like cars, computers, uh, but also including medical care, okay? Um, and further, you know, so even if you are in favor of something like, uh, you know, healthcare for all, um, most people, when they think of healthcare for all, they don't think that it would be appropriate to get rid of boutique medicine for the people who have the money to pay for it. I mean, it's one thing to say everyone deserves some decent standard of healthcare. It's another thing to say, and furthermore, no one should be allowed to access anything other than this basic decent minimum standard. If you want better than that, you're not allowed to pay to get it. You are forbidden from getting better than anyone else, okay? Very few people are okay with that. Okay, the second point they want to make is all the purchasing could be done by a by a central organization like a government, okay, um, for fair distribution. So here, for, for fair distribution, so here the idea is you don't have to necessarily have the rich people who are bidding up the price, jacking up the price on organs. What you could do instead is the people who want to sell their organs, they sell the organs to the government, to the United States government, and then the government gives them out for free to anyone who needs them based on the waiting list. Okay, So it's money for the government, and the government distributes them. So it wouldn't be unfair that the rich get organs, but it would still, you would get all the benefits of kind of incentivizing people to give up organs when we need a lot of them. Okay, so that's exploitation. Altruism, next. 
I don't want to spend too much time on this one because this objection never struck me as very plausible. But the objection goes basically like this. Uh, people giving up kidneys should do so for altruistic, uh, uh, I'll say, put it this way, on uh, do so on altruistic motives, never self selfish motives. So altruistic means like thinking of other people. So the objection goes, whenever people give up kidneys, they should be thinking of the benefit of others, never thinking about doing well for themselves. Okay? So Radcliffe Richards and her co-authors, they say, um, organ selling can also, can also be altruistic. For example, um, selling your kidney to pay for your daughter's surgery, okay? If you do that, then your motive is not to help yourself, it's to help your daughter, okay? That's one point they make. And then the other point they make is, they say, why? Why should we require that people who give up their kidneys do it only with altruistic motives, never for any selfish reason? Okay, um, no one thinks that uh, in general useful actions have to be altruistic. So no one thinks, for example, that like doctors are should be required never to get a salary. They should only practice medicine for free. That would be absurd, right? So we all think it's okay for doctors to make money and in fact make a profit to get rich from practicing medicine. Okay, the same should apply to giving up kidneys. Okay. Last set of objections. This is actually kind of a, a long set of objections. This is consequences. So the, the general thrust of all of these, uh, of this last category of objections is, um, objection, if we allow organ sales, the consequences will be bad in some way or another. So here's one. It would undermine trust in medical profession in the medical profession, if we know that you know they're just trying to make a quick buck out of transplanting organs, okay? Um, it would decrease the supply of donated organs, okay? Because once people know that you can sell your organs, no one is gonna bother trying to give them up for free, okay? Um, it would be dangerous in areas where women and children are treated as property, because then the thinking is, if you allow kidney sales in areas where women and children are treated as property, then there's an incentive to kind of force them against their will to give up their organs and then keep the money. Okay. Um, another objection is there's a slippery slope um, leading to sale of vital organs. Vital organs are the ones that you need to live. So like your heart, heart, for example. Okay. And then lastly, um, kidney sales, according to one objection, would outrage uh, public opinion. Okay, so they have responses to each of these. And I'm going to try to cram them all into one slide. And this will be, uh, whoops, sorry. Maybe I should put it down like this. Oh my gosh, it's not letting me give that up. Okay, put that up here. Okay, so they have responses to each of these that I'll just go over very briefly. Okay, so undermining trust in the medical profession, the first thing they want to say is, uh, this would be an objection to all of private practice. Private practice where doctors are in it to make money, to make a profit. Right? So we don't think that, oh, because some doctors are in it to make, um, to make money, that we just have no trust in the medical profession. All right? um, and then, also, we can distinguish selling from treatment. So one team does all the treatments, and another team is in charge of like the selling and the buying. Okay? They're just separate teams. Okay? So you don't have to have distrust in one contaminating into distrust over the other. Okay, decrease the supply of donated organs. Their response is, but it would increase supply of organs overall. And that's the important thing. Who cares about the donated organs? What we really care about is the total number of organs donated or sold, and that would go up. Okay. Um, 
for this, uh, the fact that kidney sales would be more dangerous would be dangerous in areas where women and children are treated as property. Their, resp their response is this applies even more strongly to donation. I think what they are thinking when they say this is um, even if you don't allow kidney sales, if you just have kidney transplants, then these women and children can be forced to give up their kidney to help someone else who's sick, and they won't see any money for it. Uh, you know, if there if there were payment involved, maybe they would see some money and things would be slightly better for them. Okay, slippery slope. Um, they say uh, first of all, um, this applies to donation too. You know, why do we think there's no slippery slope from donating kidneys for free to donating your heart for free? And um, it's feasible to draw the relevant distinctions. People are not going to slip down the slope. They're going to understand the difference between giving up one kidney when you have two and, you know, living with only one kidney is not so bad versus living with no heart, a.k.a. dying. They will understand the differences there. Okay. Um, so last one, they have two responses. They say, first, this is so only in the West, okay? And many other parts of the world, cadaveric donation, donation after death, is seen as worse, much more horrible than live selling, selling a live kidney, okay? And then secondly, they say, the public, it turns out, is less opposed than medical professionals are. Okay, it turns out it's the medical professionals who are like giving a lot of pushback on this. Okay, so that's this unit or the first uh, article on this unit of kidney sales where Radcliffe Richards and our co-authors discuss many different objections to selling kidneys and they try to respond to each of them. Okay, I'll see you in a little bit when I talk about uh, Eric Malmquist's argument against allowing kidney sales. Thanks.